Uh, okay, everybody. Uh, it is 12.30, and I would like to get started. Uh, first thing today, we are going to start with the uh, quiz, which is not where I expected it to be. Uh, if you go to... Reading from our, okay, so modules. Uh, add quiz reading for 12 March. Level one indent add and. Okay, if you refresh the page, the quiz should now be visible. Uh, for anyone who's going to be taking the quiz. I'll give you a few minutes at the start of class to get going on that. Um. Uh, the content for today is pretty short. I mean, I'm sure when you guys read the chapters, you realized, oh, huh, straightforward, not much here. Um, so it's going to be that, and then mostly project time today. There is a difference between the two that is addressed in the chapter. The first thing you talked about was whether we would give five dollars to Alex Cup or ten thousand dollars to each of So I assume that was long enough rather than long. We'll see how it goes. Okay, uh, let's get started. Or you know what, if there, in case there are still stragglers, how about I actually just mention one other thing real quick. Uh, the Titanic novel idea sharing has its first uh, idea on it. The Rough Intuition, which I'm very impressed with, is a group realized, hey, there might be some features that are predictive, namely what deck you're on and how far that deck is from the lifeboats. 
However, we don't have that data for every passenger. When we look at uh, ticket numbers that have what room people are on, we only have that data for maybe 20, 30 percent. 20 or 30 percent of passengers. The rest we don't know what deck they're on. However, we happen to have a very cool tool in Data Robot that's good at predicting things. So, let's train a new model to predict what deck people are on. So we use the deck information we have data on and then we just build a predictive model from there. It was a cool and interesting idea that's just kind of, there's something I want to know, we have the tool to learn it. Exactly what I'm looking for. It was an excellent suggestion. I'm happy that it came up so early. I was not expecting it till the second project. Maybe the third. Um, so, cool beans, that's an idea that somebody's got. Uh, now, on to the reading from last night. So far we have talked about a lot of details once we get into the nitty-gritty of the model. However, we kind of glossed over how you select what should be going on in the model. So that's what we're going over today. We start with a problem statement. It's pretty straightforward. There's a list of three criteria in there that define what is a good problem statement. Is it presented in the language of business? Does it specify an action that can result from the project? And how does solving the problem impact your bottom line? This keeps what you're doing nice and grounded within the context of business. It means you can present it to management. It means you can present it to uh, other departments because you're including concrete numbers and using the terms they're familiar with, instead of overloading them with jargon. And it's showing them what concrete goals are. Uh, but, I'm sorry, both goals and uh, the outcome, the results of those goals. So you're not just saying, here's what's wrong. You're saying, here is exactly what's wrong. Here's how wrong it is by using your numbers that you're throwing in here. You're proposing a way to fix it, and you're saying how that fix makes things better. So, using the Lending Club, I slightly tweaked the last Lending Club example he had in the book. So, for the first part, are we using the language of business? Yes, we're talking about investments, interest rates, and losses. We're giving concrete numbers for these. We're not just saying we could save some money, there's problems here with the numbers. No, we're saying exactly what they are where domain experts who know the details of loans can follow. What are we proposing that it will do? Our model is going to screen out risky borrowers. Then we're going to use the model to justify investing to uh, lenders. Uh, if I'm remembering how Lending Club works, it's a like a matchmaking site between borrowers who show up and say, hey, I want this loan, and lenders show up, show up and say, sure, I'll give you this loan. So being able to say, who are the bad borrowers? Let's avoid them. And being able to say, this person might look risky, but they're really not, and here's why. And finally, using it to choose which models to fund. How does that impact our bottom line? We reject high-risk borrowers. They're people that we were worried about, or that we should have been worried about, and we can just say, nah, not giving you money. It also lets us increase our profits. How does it do that? There might be someone who looks bad, but or looks like a high risk, but actually isn't. We can charge them a higher interest rate because they look like a bad loan, even though we know that they're actually pretty good. So concrete description of the problem what we plan to do to fix it, how fixing it helps us. You don't have to write one of these for the Titanic project. For some of the other projects in the course, you will. Next, we're going to talk about unit of analysis. So, 
So before you can make any predictions, you need to know what you're making predictions for. Unit of analysis asks your, answers your big questions about who or what you're making predictions for. These decisions will impact both what data you need and how you design the model. I think this can be kind of abstract, so I'm going to start with an example. So I'm going to start with an example. So start by imagining that you're a real estate broker. You know that you need to get some new people if you want to list their house. You're going to send out some sort of mailer, some, hey, I'm awesome, go work with me. If you pick, if you want to send out bulk mail, so just, I want to send something to everyone in this zip code. I tell the post office, here's $300, give everyone in this zip code a little generic flyer with my name on it. Then your unit of analysis should be zip code. Everyone within that zip code will receive the same decision. So either they will or won't receive a mailer, depends on what their zip code is. For normal mail, I want to send a postcard, it's got my name on it. My unit of analysis will be household. Why is it household? I'm deciding which households are receiving mailers. I'm only going to send one or zero to any given house. I'm not going to send one to two people in the house and... Or I'm not going to send a postcard to two people in the same house. So it's either the house gets one or the house doesn't. There is no parts of the house get it. For email, it's a little bit different. My unit of analysis is individual. So I'm saying which person is going to be likely to list with me. Once I have decided which people I want to send it to, then I will look up their email addresses. The unit of analysis is not email address here. Why isn't it email address? Because I'm never going to be in a situation where I am making a decision that your at colorado.edu email address does not get a prediction or does not get a mailer, but your at gmail does. I'm going to pick who I want to send the email to, and then once I have figured that out, I'll figure out how to get it to you. The big thing is that everyone within your unit of analysis receives the same decision. And that's what's going to be what you or that's how you're going to be predicting things, what you're going to be using uh, in your model. So on Titanic, we're predicting whether individuals are going to survive or die. We're not predicting if families are going to live or die. We are not predicting if first class passengers are going to live or die. Yes, those are features that go into the decision, but we're not trying to predict everyone in this class will live, everyone in this class will die. Selecting your unit of analysis can be tricky. I'm not going to deny that. But it is critically important, and once you start getting some practice with it, it gets very intuitive very quickly. Um, so there'll be some initial hiccups, don't worry about that, but I, you'll catch on pretty quick. So some of the questions, there was what, the generic who, what, when, where questions. So when analyzing data, selecting my unit of analysis can answer questions like who. So I could be interested in users. So everybody on my website. I want to come up with a decision over which users should receive an ad for Cabela's camping equipment. Customers, I can decide which of my customers, so not everybody on my website, but of the people on my website that are also customers, which of them should receive a flyer? My unit of analysis can be a prospective customer. People that are looking at my website but haven't made that buy something decision yet, what do I send to get them to change their mind? 
switching gears. I'm a political campaign. I know that some voter outreach efforts are more effective than others. I also know that some groups are more likely to vote than others. I want to know where I should spend my limited campaign funds in order to maximize my gain. So I look at demographic blocks. So I'll create four bins for age, I'll create three bins for race, I'll create uh, five bins for income, two votes for voted last election or not. And then I'll create some fancy hybrid of all of those categories together, which will give me what? Uh, two times three times five times, whatever all the numbers I said were multiplied together, it'll give me that many different groups. Those are demographic blocks. And then I want to predict what my return on investment will be for each block. I'm not caring about individual voters there. I am caring about white men 18 to 35 that are in the third income quintile. they will all receive the same amount of attention from me. I will not care beyond that. I can also look at it from an organizational perspective. Uh, let's say that I am manager of, a, I'm a regional manager for uh, Kroger, King Supers, that chain. I could be interested in which stores are performing well or poorly. I could also be interested in which departments are performing well or poorly. So I could say, oh man, this store is doing great. Or I could say, oh man, all of our meat sales are lagging. They're both reasonable units of analysis, trying to look for patterns within things. But I'm going to make very different decisions based on what I select. They answer different business problems. If I'm finding out that all of my meat departments are suffering, my solution will be contact a different distributor of meat. If I find out that stores in Longmont are doing poorly, my decision might be, let's shut down our Longmont store. I could not reasonably make a decision that let's shut down the Longmont store because our dairy section is doing great. There's no meaningful connection or information there. So in addition to who you're caring about, you also need to think about what you are caring about when determining unit of analysis. So I run a store. I want to know if my customer will buy anything. I want to know what my customer will buy. I want to know how many of something my customer will buy. I want to know how much they will spend so I can allocate, oh, that means they could buy four of these, two of those, or one of these, six of those. Or I want to know if a customer is likely to change their habits. These are all different things that we could predict. They are different targets. But they also entail with them that we must be changing our unit of analysis. If my unit of analysis is whether a customer will buy anything, customer is a good unit of analysis. If I want to know uh, how much a customer will spend? Customer is one possible unit of analysis, but it might be more reasonable to say transaction. So I go to King Supers four or five times a week. They have donuts and Red Bull. Don't, don't judge. Uh, they could model at a customer level how much is James going to spend this month. They could also spend at the transaction level, how much is James going to spend today? Those are both valid units of analysis, but they solve, they address different business problems. Um, similarly, what will a customer buy? Yes, what am I going to buy is certainly, I'm sorry, uh, how many units of a product will a customer buy? Customer isn't a great answer there. You need the intersection between customer and product. Because how many of X is James going to buy is going to change whether X is Red Bull, Brussels sprouts, or car chamois. Trying to keep it at the customer level would only let you predict, 
Oh, James is going to buy seven. No matter what it is we're talking about. Similarly, if we only put it at the product level, and we say anyone who buys Red Bull will buy four of them, that's not going to help us either. So our unit of analysis there is the intersection between a product and a customer. Uh, and that's for uh, how many units of a certain product. Finally, time is an interesting issue. Because when will a customer make their next purchase? Interesting question. Definitely can operate at the customer level. Will a customer make a purchase in the next two weeks? Sure. Again, customer level. Am I going to buy something in two weeks? Uh, you know, actually, now that I look at these, all of these are customer example, or would be at the customer level. <laughs> ah, I do it. For this one here, instead of how long will a customer's contract last, if it was how long will a customer have this device? That would be an interaction between customer and device. Think Verizon. My, the family plan that I've got has nine devices on it amongst the four of us. Oh, three because my brother's in the UK now. So I have a phone. My mom has a phone and an iPad. My dad has a phone and an iPad. Uh, there is also a wireless a jet something. Basically, it's a Wi-Fi, a local Wi-Fi that uses a cellular signal. So we've got all these different devices. How long will my family have that device? Is a family to device. You need both. Which is different than family to contract. How long are we under contract? Eternity. That's how cell phone contracts work now. Always have worked, I suppose. And it's important, and again, one of the biggest things I want to stress here for unit of analysis is that there are multiple right answers and they will depend on your business problem. So let's go through a few examples, see if you guys can't tell me what you think the unit of analysis is. So I am a city government of some sort, mayor, town council, whatever. We have the question, is our airport competitive with other cities? What's the unit of analysis going to be here? Exactly. We're going to have, uh, we're trying to predict how bad the delays are on a per airport level. So airports are unit of analysis. That'll let us say, hey, our airport is fifth from the top. Awesome, we're doing pretty well. Or we're twelfth from the bottom. Oh man, arson is the solution. Next, let's consider I'm an employer. We've got some fancy system for reimbursing employees who go on business trips. However, we want to make sure that, for simplicity's sake, we're only going with a handful of airlines. There's only a few different people they can book with, just so that we're being one giant block and we get a discount for that. What's the unit of analysis here? Airline. Bingo. It is airline. How many people just have the slides open right now and are clicking next one step ahead of me? OK. So the unit of analysis is airline here. Because, yes, there's lots of delays, and you're figuring that out, but you're trying to figure out which airlines are really bad about delays. You don't care what individual planes do or what individual routes or tickets have. You care about, in general, does this airline suck? I mean, yes, but does it suck worse than the others? Now you're a mechanic. You work for the airline. Which planes need the most maintenance time? You, need, you know that you're going to have a bunch of crew that you have to send to different things. You have to budget their time. What are you going to choose to budget based on? 
you're probably not going to want to select individual planes. You're not going to say, oh man, this plane always has problems with uh, the fuel line freezing. Instead, you're going to say, this model of plane tends to have problems with the fuel line freezing. Therefore, whenever you get one of those planes, you know that you need to uh, allocate a little more time. A competitor can be interested in what routes have a lot of delays. Because, oh man, if all the other airlines are screwing up Denver to Dulles, I have a chance to do well there. I'll just add more flights that go that route and make sure my delays aren't bad. Then I become the attractive one for that Denver to Dulles route. <coughs> if you're an air traffic controller, you might want to know, is thunder or snow a bigger source of delay? It'll help you plan and mitigate. It'll help you announce delays further in advance or know when you need to get extra staff on. And it's possible that you'll have combinations of any of these, especially things like which weather is worst. I'd imagine that, that, that there are people who would be interested in what the model of plane is combined with the weather. So you're a mechanic, you know, hey, these planes are really bad in the heat. The point of this slide is there are lots of right answers and they depend on your business problem. I couldn't just say, what's the unit of analysis and give you a data set? You would not be able to come up with a unique answer to that. And the last thing I want to go over is target selection. We've talked a little bit about this before in the types and goals of machine learning. But I'm just going to bring it up again real quick because it's a good refresher to have. Classification. You're trying to predict a category. Binary is when you have exactly two categories. Usually it's a does exist, doesn't exist. Did happen, didn't happen. Good idea, bad idea. The other kinds of classification, I technically was a little sloppy. There is multi-class and multi-label. The only difference here is how many you're allowed to have. So multi-class means I have more than two groups, but each person is only in one group. So is your grade an A, a B, a C, a D, or an F? You cannot have an AD grade in a specific class. Multi-label classification is for something where you have, you can actually think of it as a series of binaries because you have multiple different labels and a specific group can have more than one. So is this movie a comedy, a drama, a historical fiction, a fantasy, a sci-fi? It is possible to have a comedy sci-fi movie. That answer has multiple labels, so it is a multi-label classification. And as I said, you can think of it as it's two different binary classifications. Is it a comedy? True, false. Is it sci-fi? True, false. So that's how it works. And it is, in fact, possible to have, no, it doesn't meet any of my groups. The more groups you have, the less likely that is. but. Uh, that's how multi-label versus multi-class work. Regression is when you're predicting a continuous value, almost always a number. Most of the time, regression is going to be predicting a value. How tall is this baby going to be when it grows up? Uh, what will this person's credit score be in six months? How much can I get away with charging this person before they will stop being my customer? The other thing you can wind up with is using aggression to predict a probability. So you can say, I am 80% sure this person will survive. 
I am 22% sure this person is going to buy something. That's the only difference. It, mathematically, they're mostly the same thing. Um, it's just what you're trying to predict is ever so slightly different conceptually. Uh, one other thing that this chapter covered that I think is important, so I want to go over it, is how data collection can interact with target, uh, with selecting your target. So I'm going to go with an example of divorce. I'm sure everyone here has heard that half of all marriages end in divorce. Turns out that's a statistical fallacy. And let's go over why. How can a marriage end? One or more partners dies, or there's a divorce. There aren't a lot of other ways to get out of marriage. On average, a divorce will happen eight years after the marriage, or at least the first marriage will end eight years after if it's going to end in a divorce. The average length of a marriage that doesn't end in a divorce is about 50 years. So, I randomly generate nine marriages here. I've got, in red, two divorces. One, two. I have two successful marriages. Success being somebody died. One, two. When I collected my data in 2018, I have five more marriages that I don't know how they're going to end. Now, that's five people that I have incomplete data on. How can I categorize them? How can I label them as a successful marriage or an unsuccessful marriage? I could call them successful because, well, they haven't ended yet. Or I could call them failures because I don't know that it'll end with somebody dying. A more common solution, or generally the preferred solution, is throw out data where we don't have an end condition on. So, we have a 50-50 here. Instead of trying to say it's 7 and 2, or 2 and 7, we're saying it's 2 and 2, and then just saying we have 5 we don't know on. Now, this does come with its own set of problems. Most notably, we've thrown out most of our data. But beyond that, we've also thrown out stuff that, like, this looks really long. If they got married in 65 or so, and they're still married in 2018, their odds of divorce aren't super high. So, I've thrown out something that probably could have been useful. Uh, similarly with this couple that got married in 82. I'm a little less certain for this uh, 98, and I have no idea for these 2009 or uh, 2011s. But, I'm throwing out data that's probably useful. Now, that is not an ideal thing. You generally don't want to throw out useful data. However, you don't, if you really don't know, it can be tough. Uh, if I'm remembering correctly, the example from the book was, is a loan going to default? Um, they had paid on time, paid on time, paid on time, paid on time, and then they had 15-day windows for how late they were before it reached, once it's past 90 days, it's in default. So that was how they labeled the data. Now, anyone who had paid on time for the whole thing and then they were done, great. Anyone who had defaulted before our cutoff date, well, we know what their category is. How do we classify someone that is 22 days past due? They haven't defaulted yet. They have 68 days left. 
And the answer is, that's exactly how this is a problem and exactly what we need to worry about. When trying to figure out how to select data for, or how to create our targets and decide what we're doing, this is the problem we come across. Um, it also entails the messy complication of, for, for the loan data specifically, you won't get your most recent data because the most frequent solution is just say, well, I ignore anything that I'm currently unsure of. So when I get rid of all the blues here, I'm getting rid of anything that's currently ongoing. That means that none of my predictions apply to anything I currently have. So I've just created a model that I know doesn't apply to anything I have. That sounds bad. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of great solutions to it. It's just something that you need to be aware of and you need to try different things to get around. So pick an earlier cutoff, only use data that is concluded, or pick only include data that's been concluded. Pick an earlier cutoff so that you know what the final goal is, even if you only have partial data. Try putting ongoing in its most likely category. Try creating a, a multi-class classifier that has the two classes you care about plus ongoing so that you'll know these are things I think will end in divorce, these are things I think will end in death, these are things that I'm pretty sure are still going on so my model's going to be bad. You need to take all of these approaches so that you can be robust against the kinds of errors this creates. Um, so, With that, we're good for content today. Now we're going to go and play around in Data Robot and Alteryx and work on the Titanic project. And my understanding is there's a number of questions about that. And there's some confusion and some stuff that isn't working. So we're going to work through all of that. So get in your groups. Wander around, do not leave. <clears throat> Per team, I don't care who submits. Each team is responsible for the four parts of the assignment. But you have the, so the question was you have that leaderboard, right? And if one of us is doing the, the, the working together and all doing the, the regressions together, the test together on one. So we're submitting it from one Kaggle. Yeah. Uh, once you have created a team, it should just have all of the leaderboard together as one. So once you've joined a Kaggle team, it should all count as one thing. I'm trying to add the third person to my team, and it won't let me add them. You can only add one person at a time, so they have to accept it. They already did. Uh -huh. So. Uh. How about you come on up and we'll take a look at it.
Teams proposing a merge. So is. Credit. So you're unable to. Ah, uh, that could be it. Um. Yeah, that would be my suggestion. Yeah. See if Chris has the option to do it. Um, and if not, it might be that you need to, um, so it's unable to merge with other teams in this competition, so it might be you need to add him to this instead of merging the two teams. Okay. okay. How would you do that, do you know? I do not. Um, okay. I'm pretty sure that the team leader should have an option to, um, should have some more options here that'll do that. Uh, Cosmo, you had a question at the start of class that I thought was pretty good. Let me go up and answer it on a whiteboard. So the question Cosmo asked was, I'm confused about the exact flow going on here. So the rough overview of what we have is Kaggle has some files in it. Most important are train and test. What you are going to do is open up Alteryx, take the train, transform it. This transformation will include feature engineering, imputing missing data, anything like that. Anything you can do in Alteryx to get more information out of the data you have. You make all those changes. Then you go to Data Robot, where you take your transformed stuff and you generate a model. The model will be here's how I predict who survived, who didn't, using the transformed training data. Once you have this model, you then take the test data from Kaggle. You apply the same transformation. So this will create new features. It will impute missing data, anything like that. So that you will have the exact same columns here that you do in the transformed version here. And then you will use the model to predict from the transformed test data, you will use the predict function to make a prediction of what your data is. So one, two, three, four. You will then take this prediction upload it that the predictions that you generated are what gets uploaded to Kaggle. This is generally speaking what you're doing in your process. Now last class we talked about things you can learn from your model. So we talked about feature impact and variable importance and that sort of thing. There are two things that you can do with that information. One, you can use it in your write-up because the write-up requires you to say what features are important, uh, what is highly predictive, that sort of thing. That's a component of your write-up, so having feature impacts and variable importance helps with that. 
being able to justify your positions and justify how you said, why does sex matter? Why does age matter? That's how you'll be using the feature importance stuff. That is the way that everyone in the class is going to be using those sorts of information. Some of you who choose to do so may also add an intermediate step here. So instead of you make your model in data robot and then immediately start transforming your test and predicting, you can also say these are the good features from the model. I am going to make model 2. So I am going to, using the same transformed data, instead of using all of the columns, I'm only going to use three or four very predictive columns or highly impactful columns. You can also say, oh man, this model taught me something. I want to go back to Alteryx, make some new transformations, and then make a new model from those. So if you find out that name is highly predictive, and then the reason name is highly predictive is because title is very good. So it says, Mr., Master, Miss, Colonel, if it finds those are the impactful parts of name, then you could go back into Alteryx, make some new transformations, where you would say, let's make a new column called title. And then we can impute that data for people we don't have labels on. Or we could say, make a new category for uh, professional titles versus uh, titles related to age or other things like that based on the insights we gained from the first model. That's not required for this project, but it is one way that you can use the feature importances, variable impacts, uh, the text stuff, the word clouds. It's how you can use all of those to refine your workflow. Um, so everyone's got to use it in their write-up. Anyone who wants can use it to refine their transformations in Alteryx, which entails, of course, making new models and that sort of thing. Cool. Uh, yes. Okay, uh, could you come up here and log in to your data robot? Yep, you can be logged in multiple locations at once. Um, one other question that I've had a few people ask. It's all the same. Um, so let me log out. Yeah, so it basically once you log in, I want you to show me what you, uh, what's going on. So, uh, quick question. How many groups have submitted at least two predictions? How many groups have submitted at least five? How many have submitted at least ten? How many have submitted at least twenty? Cool. I am looking for hopefully, between 10 and 20 from each group. Uh, as for the number of submissions, I am expecting the number of submissions with improvement to be somewhere around three or four. Um, why the huge discrepancy here? Data Robot is very good at what it does, so you're probably going to get a pretty high score pretty quick. However, comma, there is still utility and value in trying things that you think are might be good, 
even if their numbers aren't quite exactly the highest you have access to, because it's possible that there's problems in something. So you can go ahead and submit, well, this is my third best model on my leaderboard, but I still want to try it and submit it on Kaggle. So that's why I'm looking for 10 to 20 submissions with three, four, maybe five that show improvement. Um, you guys do have until Friday at 5 p.m. So with 10 submissions per day as the cap per team, uh, that gives you, today's Monday, so 10, 20, 30, 40. You will either have 50 or 60, I don't know when it resets. Um, because I don't know Greenwich Mean Time off the top of my head. Um, but you have plenty of time to make all of these submissions. So, you logged in? You good? Yeah. Did you want me to come up here so I can like, do this for everyone? Or? I, I, that's kind of the point here is to get... I'm assuming a lot of people are having the same problems. Okay. So, that's why I want to show everybody up here at once. So, what have you got? Okay, so we created a, we, on all tricks, we created a row with, called title, where we parsed for different titles, and then we put it in here, and it came out as categorical, even though we were messing with the data type in all tricks too to try to change it, to try to get it to text, and we want it to be text type, uh, type because then we can go to text mining and insult their insights but we don't have that right now and we can't figure out how to get that okay I can show you that one so if you are interested in changing a data type from what Alteryx tries to figure out on its own you can go and click this arrow labeled create a new feature and change var type and then you can go transform to in this case we want text so then I'll just create the feature, and now you have a new thing, once it is done being created. Title text. And now, once you've got this, you are going to want to create a new feature list. So you'll select the features that you care about. There's probably a select all button. Um, and then type in create new feature list. Um, <laughs> Title text, create, and now you can run autopilot on a different feature list and select title text, push to restart. When you click push to restart, it will not get rid of existing models you have. It will stop running anything it's currently working on, but it will not eliminate existing models. So. Once you get to your Models tab, you can see all the stuff with informative features is still here. You can then, within your leaderboard for models, select only ones you're interested in. So title text is what I care about. And it shows me the status on the new feature list we created. Um, this process right here of creating a new feature list is probably going to be your easiest way to use the Model Insights tab to select only the features you really care about. So instead of going to Alteryx and only uploading some of it, <coughs> if you just want to say, show me the same thing but with only three features, you can go into your Data tab, check the three features that were best, create a new thing called Top 3, and run Autopilot on that. So that way you don't have to leave Data Robot in order to make the next round of changes here. That, yes. Does that yeah. answer everything? Yeah. Cool. I also, um, we had a similar one. I, I downloaded it. We could, I could put the data in if you want, or I could just tell you. It's, just, it's a similar thing that we did on Alteryx, except this one was we uh, had titles, and then we binned for different age groups. Yeah. And we're just kind of curious when we put, if we put something like that in all our data robot, um, 
how can we use, I don't know, like what the models it gives us to see how those two kind of relate to each other or predictive. Like, I guess I could, it gives us some graphs and stuff on how predictive each bin is, but it's hard to tell how we can like, really apply that or uh, we're having a hard time okay. figuring out how to use that information in data robot. So the, I suspect that is what the hotspot tool is supposed to be for, but as I admitted, I don't super know how that works. Um, but you can within, God, where is it? Uh, that's not the one you want. Uh, so you know what I'm going to say now that I look at this? That would be a great thing for you to do for the novel idea contribution. Look into a good way to show interaction between variables. Okay. Um, I have a few ideas if you want to message me on Slack about those, but that's a good enough idea that if you guys want to stake a claim to that, go ahead and do so. Cool. Yeah, that sounds good. All righty. Yeah. I think yes. you have any other questions from uh, the other day. I can't think of any right now. I think those are the big ones, yeah. yeah. All righty. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks. Right. Cool beans. Log out of my account. Okay. Sure. Should it behoove us to uh, create all the permutations of things that we thought we could do in the data in all tricks, and then as you said, we can run select these columns or not these columns, which is kind of do a one shot of all the different ideas that we had, and then just run it through data robot. So. Uh, as long as you're not doing the make new models and transforming again, that absolutely is a great way to do it. Simply because if you upload a new data set, it creates a new project. You can't have multiple, or you can't have multiple data sets on a single project. So if you just want to go and create, here's a thousand different fields, I upload them all at once, and then I select here are four fields at a time, or here are 12 fields at a time, that is absolutely a reasonable approach to go for. The biggest thing I would caution you on if you take that approach is by default, it will do something called informative features as what it selects to build a model on. That informative features takes into account uh, interactions to some degree. And if you're just uploading, what happened if I binned age with three, five, and 10 bins, then the impact of two of those options is going to be almost nothing. So you can't rely on the informative feature selection if you do something like that, but it's still a good approach. Um, and if you want to have that as your novel contribution, show a comparison of how you did that, look at some of the differences or how you overcame the informative features being lacking, that sounds like a great novel idea. You can go on the PowerPoint and claim it quick. Sure. Come on up here. Log in. I'm running something right now. Is it gonna? No. Nope. You can log in multiple places. It's not gonna change anything. <laughs> For this project, it's not gonna matter. For future projects, it will. So you want to know how to add features here? Yeah. Okay. Or like select and whatever. Yeah. Okay. So once you are on the data tab, if you want to make new features or change features in some way, you will go and select the little check boxes next to features that you want to use together. So let's just make. Then, like the yeah, so it's by default it's sorted by importance. So let's go prefix fair cabin class. Just that will give you the option to create a new feature list. Once at least one of them is checked, you can create a new feature list and call it whatever you want. Okay. Um, so go ahead and name that something.
Okay, and then click Create. So now you have a new feature list that has importance relative to that list and gives you the information about it. To go back and look at things originally, you'll go to Feature List and then say All Features. And now if you want to make some transformations, you click this arrow and change variables. Uh, let's see, that's not going to be super interesting for... So but you can change the variable type, so like if something comes through as categorical and you want it to be Boolean or something. Right. Yeah, so let's say passenger class. Right now, that is listed as numeric. Seems reasonable, there's first, second, and third. However, it's possible that we are interested in, or maybe it's not a linear relationship between first, second, and third class. Maybe it's first, second, or maybe the gap between first and second is big, but second and third is small, or something like that. So I would change that to a categorical. I'm selecting treat nan is missing, because I know that there's some uh, stuff there. And now I have a categorical feature out of here. And it has P class as categorical in it. Uh, let's also look at fair. Fair is numeric. Maybe fair isn't linear. Maybe the relationship should be something else. So let's look at fair squared. So the more you pay, the more it helps that you paid more. And we can add another one. F of fair. Uh, custom feature equals. Oh, it doesn't have a help button right here. Well, never mind. Don't bother trying to make your own function. Um, but maybe fair is useful on a squared scale. Um, and I believe the reason it's blocking out log is because there's uh, zeros in here. But something like that. Let's see, what else do we have that's uh, age? There we go. Let's add log of age. I have no reason to think log of age is actually going to be useful. But log of age and age squared. And now I can create a new bizarre feature list uh, that includes three kinds of age. Oh, come on. Oh, there we go. Two kinds of fair. the P class I actually care about, and sex. And I will call this feature set nonsense, because there was no sense behind what I was doing. And then run autopilot on a different feature list. And I could go and run it on nonsense or the net class and fair that you did, but I will not do that because it would interrupt any currently running models. Oh, autopilot is finished. Then sure, I will run it on something. I'll run it on nonsense. Just because someone foolishly trusted me to click buttons. So that is how you go about transforming features within Data Robot and how you go about using those transform features to make a new feature list. And with your new feature list, you can run the models again. And you can go ahead and log out. Okay. In order to log out, click on this little person button and then sign out. Uh, did you have a question? No. Yes, you had a question earlier, right? So, if it was actually using just name, then name would be terrible for that reason. However, because or if you changed name from a text field to like a categorical or something, it would have that problem and it would fail. However, 
data robot will say, this is text. Let's see what features I can pull out of the text automatically. So it'll break it into separate words, and it will, yeah, so it'll pull titles out. Um, and other things like that, which is why name winds up being good, but not perfect, because it looks at parts of it in addition to looking at the whole. You could try both and see which one is better. Um, I know in the sample data set that I've shown in all of my previews, I did not check name. Um, I mean, it was included in the set, but I unchecked it. Because I pulled out title and I pulled out spouse. If you'll notice, some of the names have another name in parentheses after it. That is the spouse. Um, so, are you traveling with your spouse? Could be a reasonable feature to impute or to uh, engineer. What is the, uh, there's the SIB, that number of siblings? So, come on up here. You have asked a question that should be on video. So, come on up. So go ahead and log on into Kaggle. He's done. We'll log in and look at it. I don't know. Because I don't know exactly what you're talking about. I don't have, like, what should I, I sign in with Google? So. Oh, well, then click Google. And then sign in with Google. Okay. And then there should be a, use another account. Gotcha. So, go to the Titanic page. <laughs> I'm so not used to having to actually click on the left side. Yeah, and my track is a little busted anyway. Click that. Click that. Click that. It wants to move while I click. Okay. Scroll down. I'm sorry, I uh, click the data. And scroll down. And now it explains what they are. So, if you are confused about what a field is in your data, you can go to the data tab in the Kaggle competition. And scrolling down, you will find descriptions of what they are. So, what is SIB SP? Number of siblings or spouses you have aboard the Titanic. P arch, the number of parents or children you have aboard the Titanic. Okay. So, now we've got a decent uh, way to know what our new data is. You can go ahead and log out now. Come on back up, log back in. And data robot, right? There you go. <laughs> so go to insights. Text mining, and then so here's like effect, and it just has a scale, and I have no idea what any of those mean. Uh -huh. Yeah. 
And since hovering over doesn't tell us anything. And this is wrong. So all this is, is it's a relative weighting. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it's relative to, but uh, don't think of it as having any terrible meaning okay. um, beyond big positive numbers, good, big negative numbers, bad. Numbers in the middle, less predictive. Yeah. Okay. Um, so don't worry too much about exactly what they're supposed to represent. Okay. No, it, it, that's not you. You're not familiar. It's me needing to get my mouse fixed. <laughs> yeah. um, I have another question for everybody, or four of them, I suppose. So for number of models submitted, we've got one or two for most groups. Submissions are a big part of the grade. Another big part is the write-up. How many groups have started the write-up? You want just like one write-up for the whole thing at the end, right? Not even three <coughs> Yeah, no, no, no. Your write-up is one per the whole thing. Um, how many of you have, I already know the answer to this. So far only one group has their novel idea up, and I think two more have ideas for what they want to do. Okay. How many of you have your Alteryx workflows ready to go and submit for the models that you have used? Or for whatever the best model you've used is? Okay. So do remember there are four parts of this assignment that are based on the grade, or that your grade is based on. You're going to want to make sure you allocate time for all of them instead of trying to pull them all off Friday afternoon. Um, in particular, the novel idea thing, you can get going very early on. You could do it before you have a model that's great or a model that works. And the write-up, you can actually get started on as soon as you've started running some models because you'll have some notion of feature importances or variable impacts or things like that. So you can get started on those even though you don't have your final submission ready. Do not wait until you have your top score to do the other parts of the assignment.